building. Maybe we should have this portable because some of the building really is not user friendly. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Mangalnye. Uh, uh, Honorable Masango. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just sorry that I can't show my video because my connection is quite weak. Uh, we know, we know your picture. We know your picture. Don't worry. No problem. Thanks, Chair. <laughs> I just want to uh, uh, agree with, uh, in fact, thank the department for the presentation, and also agree with both you, uh, Honourable Chair, and Honourable Minister, about the fact that uh, the fight and response against GBV is multi is, is non-partisan, it's multi-sectoral, and it, it's something that we all have to fight uh, against uh, all together. I just am very excited uh, to see the, the pillars that have been presented here this morning, uh, this today, and, and just hope that the pillars don't become silos in practice that all the leading um, departments of the various pillars work in silos and at the in the process the women are falling between the the the, the, the pillars and they don't get the service that uh, is being is being is being done by the by the NS, the, 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 the the NSP I believe and also chair I see that, um, oh, I wanted to find out if the people, the NGOs, as we all work together on this, the NGOs uh, and the, and the uh, organizations, government uh, commissions, such as the Commission for Gender Equality uh, and the organizations like POA and all those that work in this sector, if there will be a time at any stage where we will get to hear as the portfolio committee what it is that the you know the the strides that they are making in the work that they are doing in fighting uh, uh, gender-based violence and femicide. As far as the um, the database is concerned, I just want to to also add my 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 voice into this because it is proving to be such a challenge, and I I seem to have heard the the honourable minister some time ago saying that there was a partnership that was entered into that was going to this the partner with whom the department was working was going to help with this database situation and i just would like to know how far that process is uh, in in terms of actually making sure now that we don't keep saying we are working on on getting the database sorted out but where we are saying there is a database that is in place as it were as far as the 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 work that is being done the 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 the, the very amazing work that is being done by the command center in just also confirming is that one would like to know that that there is some aftercare mechanism of sorts that these women are not just phoning on the day and and are referred but that th there is some kind of knowing whether they are out of that situation or they are working to get out of the situation in, in the process and also Chair, I'm just asking you if it's possible, especially now that we are having this, this uh, document that was presented today, to actually have a standing item or on GBVF like we are having with the with COVID, if that is possible at all. It's just my 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 um, request for that. I thank you, Chairperson, for your time. Thank you, Honorable Masango, uh, Honorable Icon. What has gone wrong? Uh, it was Honorable Masang, am I right? Now, Honorable Mtao. Yes. Honorable Mtao. Uh, thank you, Chair. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Aye, um, aye, aye. You must see a doctor, man. I have said it yesterday. Yes, okay. All right, proceed. <laughs> Uh, what uh, what were the contributions? This one, I think, member uh, Ngwenya touched on it. What were the contributions made by the department made to the Domestic Violence Act 
and criminal law on sexual offense related matters. Mm. Related matters and to strengthen do you have to do this? I don't think you should do this to yourself. Okay. I don't Let's think you have to chair. do this to yourself. I think Let's you must attend chair, to your... then Maybe the member can write the question. You can write then... down and uh, we will deal with it. Okay, Honorable Mdown. Okay, sir. Please, don't do this to yourself. You okay. must actually look after your health. We need you here. Okay, sir. Okay. Thanks. Honorable Stock. Honorable Stock. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, let me also join my colleagues in welcoming the presentation of the department. Uh, let me also join my uh, colleagues in welcoming that good presentation. Uh, we also need to appreciate the kind of work that has been done by, uh, by, by, by both the Department of Social Development uh, as well as the Department of Correctional Services. We have also noted that there's a lot of legislative work done by the two departments. Uh, for an example, when it comes to Department of Correctional Services, the Cyber Crimes Bill, and then also on the social development side is the amendment of the Children's Bill, uh, which has been conducted to deal with GBV in the country. Uh, but my only concern, Honorable Chair, is that uh, uh, this work that has been done by these departments is not being consolidated into one approach. Uh, so from my side, I would like to find out what has been the progress in consolidating this legislative work into one approach so that we can have a single picture of the state of GBV in the country. We would also like to find out when can the joint committees expect a report in this approach, uh, if that is going to be possible to consolidate uh, the work of the two departments into one. How will also the two departments, the work of the two departments contribute to the implementation of the national strategic plan on GBV as uh, it has been highlighted uh, in terms of the six pillars. Uh, and then lastly, I would also like to find out as the department forced the partnership of the Department of Public Works in December 2019 as part of the emergency response plan on GBV. This is important in finding spaces for Kuseleka, One Stops, and the White Door Safety Spaces for Hope in six identified provinces. Uh, so it's, it's also important that the department takes us into confidence uh, about the progress in terms of this partnership. And then also as the process of formalizing the memorandum of understanding being finalized, and then what is the contents of that memorandum of understanding if it is there. And then also in relation to the six provinces that have been identified, uh, when will the remainder of the three provinces receive spaces for their own Kuseleka centers in the wide door? safe spaces. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Honorable Stock. Uh, can I come to the department? Uh, uh, you've got strictly 15 minutes, otherwise time is bad. Maybe, we, let's say up to quarter. Represent. Yeah, I Hi, how did I miss you? Represent. Oh, how I did I miss you? Okay. You were, no, 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 Honorable Bilangolu. Yes. You appeared here. I don't know who removed you. Tell that person to bring me back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, speak now. Uh, and also, yeah. But you are not here, Honorable Vanna. <laughs> no, thank, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair, and good morning to the Minister, Deputy Minister, and everybody else in this meeting. Um, in acknowledging the research that has been conducted on the uh, impact of the GBV helpline, which depicts a picture of GBV victims who aren't willing to open cases and who experience a high level of post-traumatic stress, how does the National Strategic Plan on GBV advocate for the addressing of these challenges? Secondly, Chair, 
What has the research study gathered from the GBV helpline revealed in terms of the state of GBV in the country? And again, how has this research contributed to the intervention provided by the department in addressing GBV? How has it contributed to the input made by the department in the national strategic plan on GBVF? Lastly, Chairperson, I just want to check uh, from the department if sometimes one way or the other, if they do get the report from the justice system on how all the GBV cases are being handled across the country. Thank you very much, Chair. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Mbana? Thanks, Chair. Mine are similar to the ones of Honorable Vilangul, but I'm interested to get uh, the information in terms of out of the revised budget adjustment vote. Has the department ensured that its targets are in line with a national strategy plan? The last one, I think she has asked about the challenges that the department is encountering out of the budget that we have. Then I would like to get the, the, the solution of those challenges that they are experiencing or encountering. Thanks, uh, Thank you, Honorable Mbana. Uh, uh, I know the minister expressed a genuine worry about the time we give to responses. Uh, I'll take a risk and say, can you take up until 10 to, Minister? Minister? Are we still together? Hey, Lindy, what happened? I don't know, because the minister is, I saw her picture, and LinkedIn, I can see LinkedIn. DJ. I'm also here, the uh, minister. Uh, can you guys respond up until 10 to? Yeah, I'm here, Chairperson. I think it's just a. Can I can I ask the department to to respond because there's very little time. It will just come at the end of their response. Okay. Uh, I think LinkedIn didn't uh, unmute. We cannot hear. Unmute through you, Chen. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, LinkedIn, where are you? I can see him. He's talking, but we can't hear him. LinkedIn! Can somebody pinch him or phone him, do whatever? No, Chaperson, I can see him. He's on the screen, uh, but I'm but not is, sure is what's he, happening is, to him. Is he line. aware that we, we can't hear him? Because now I can't even see him. I can see him. Um, I can see him. I can see his gesturing and moving and talking, oh, by but the way, we you, can't you, hear him. You are, using, you are using a different device. That's why you're seeing him. But the point I'm making is that... Uh, I can't hear him at least. Uh, can somebody respond? Can, can, to do can, 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 can the team take there. over those can, can you hear me now, sir? Yes, we can hear you. What was going on? Hey. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Chair. I will ask uh, Tisa just to respond very quickly uh, to one or two of the elements, and then I will, I will ask the CEO of NDA to also just speak to the current issue, and then I will um, uh, add one or two inputs very quickly. We'll make it in time. Okay. Susan? Okay. Thank you, Chen. 
I'll respond on the issue of funding of CSOs, inconsistency of funding of the CSOs. That has been a challenge for some time, but now it's going to be resolved because we are waiting for the funding policy framework to be approved first. That will allow us to do the standardization. It has been done. It has been approved. It's a question of now um, seeking more funding to make sure that um, we also have adequate funding to fund because we're no longer going to fund per pro. We are going to fund per program rather than an item or the way we used to fund. So that issue is going to be resolved. The issue on the stats, yes, of course, it is a challenge. The, the stats at the stage that uh, we've got data, we don't have an electronic database system. We, we That was the problem. But now the problem is, is resolved because we've got an IA, IJS program, uh, intersectoral justice system program that we, we are benefiting from. They're assisting us to put the systems in place. We had to agree as all the sectors to say what are the indicators that we are all going to be reporting on and to also give each other access in terms of their system. For us to access subsystem, subs access our system. That process is done. It's a, it, we, are, we are about to, to roll out the system. We are waiting for the gadgets uh, to be, roll, to, to be um, uh, distributed in provinces. But the system, as I speak, is readily available. We just have to migrate from the paper base to an ele electronic system. They, and then there the were questions around the policy. Uh, the, yes, we have developed the policy, we are developing the policy on psychosocial services. The intention of the policy is to address the provision of psychosocial services, not to, to, to deal with the social workers as the people that are, that are doing that. But the policy is there to you know, regulate the space because currently we don't have a policy that regulates the space of how to provide psychosocial services. And we've got a lot of players within the space. And because the space is not regulated, it becomes messy. For instance, we've got other policy who are providing trauma counseling. We've got healers who are providing trauma counseling. We've got volunteers who are providing trauma counseling. We've got professionals, social workers, psychologists who are providing trauma counseling, but there is no framework that guides how this activity must be done. So we needed the policy to deal with that space so that we know who are the players, who does what, and who gives over to who. So that's what the, that, that's the intention of the policy. The, the other issue is there was a question around the intersectoral, poli intersectoral shelter policy to uh, the timelines. It is a target that is on our APP. We are chasing that target. We are going to achieve it in this financial year. Mm -hmm. And we are on track mm -hmm. with it. The, the question mm -hmm. on uh, the command center, I think for command center, we will add, we appreciate the inputs, we will add those elements because the command center, the way it was uh, conceptualized, it was just a phone in service where we refer, we will provide the counseling services immediately. Thereafter, if a person needs follow-ups or more sessions, we then refer to a uh, to a service that is available at a local level. But um, I hear what uh, members are saying. We will see how we build the, the system to make sure that we do you know, follow-ups. We can actually track a victim and say what transpired after a victim has access services from us. Yeah, just the last one is on the Kuselekas. It must be the last one, Yes, yes. The Kuselekas, the question was around what about the three Kuselekas? Why are they not here? Because we only refer to six. The three, they already have the Kuselekas. We've got Kuselekas in Limpopo, Northwest, and Eastern Cape. The six provinces that do not have Kuselekas, those are the ones that we are currently targeting and we are working with public works to ensure that they do have their own Kuselekas at the end of the year. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Maybe Thank just, you. Three, just three things, Chair, from my side. One, there's been a lot of uh, comments this, this morning or this afternoon around data um, uh, from the Gender-Based Command Center. Let me just indicate that we've now moved to a new premises, which is much bigger, um, and we'll be able to accommodate a little bit more of our staff. Uh, and uh, what we want to do is we want to have a command center in the true sense of a command center with big screens that you're able to, uh, to tell what's happening across the country in real-time data. Um, uh, providing real-time data, rather. So we, expect, we have expanded that, and we hope that uh, we'll be able to invite this committee to come and view the center very soon, uh, as soon as we have everything up and running. Maybe just to respond to um, Honorable Abrams' question around 
um, uh, the impact of some of the work that we're doing and uh, determining the challenges and successes. We want to um, look at, an implement, uh, at implementing an evaluation um, uh, or an, imp an implementation evaluation study to see um, what are the lessons we can learn and what impact we're having on the ground. That will also assist us in informing uh, future policy making. But maybe also to respond to the issue of um, um, uh, member Adris. Um, yes, indeed, there is a shortage of shelters. Um, it continues to be a challenge. Uh, we've highlighted on slide number 10 some of the uh, districts which include some of the rural areas um, that we are uh, that we have shel shelters in. And maybe in terms of Honorable Panamaraba's uh, question around the Eastern Cape. Um, so we're meeting the provinces uh, tomorrow uh, to further get a sense of what are some of the challenges around the payments uh, of NPOs. I know that some of the challenges in some provinces has largely been attributed to uh, the impact of COVID. So uh, some of the, um, uh, the colleagues were not able to go to the centers to go and verify indeed that this is taking place and so on and so forth. So that has caused a bit of a stir um, uh, because they were not able to move. There was a strike also. Uh, we advised in the Eastern Cape around this. Uh, and uh, some of the staff, uh, I'm also told, uh, have uh, that normally process this work, have uh, uh, succumbed to COVID-19. But these are areas that we are, are taking up with the provinces to see how best we can assist in terms of improving um, or speeding up the payment, rather. Thank you, Chair. I'm done. Uh, is the department done? Uh, I would then ask the minister and the deputy minister, but maybe the CEO, um, uh, sorry, the deputy minister first, then the, then the minister. But I think the CEO may want to talk to the cut of funding. Just the amount uh, to confirm the exact amount. That's it. You've got many CEOs. Which CEO? CEO of NDA. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Just Good amount. afternoon. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Minister. Good afternoon, CEO of NDA. Uh, I need to respond to um, uh, Honorable Adrams in terms of the figure. Indeed, it's 100,000, and the breakdown of the 100, uh, 100 million, uh, pardon me, 100 million breakdown, it's 45 million as per MOU that was signed with the department. 45 million was the first tranche for us to get started, as you might know that we started in January. And uh, the second tranche will be uh, as when we produce a report from the first tranche. The five million will be for administration work that has been implemented by NDA since the, uh, the start of the program. And as we see today, 131 uh, NPOs or civil society organizations have benefited in terms of transfer to the value of 17.4 million. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, uh, Minister. Yourself and whoever else, you've got 10 minutes to close, or five. Okay, 10, right? Minister? Chairperson, I'm not sure if the DM wants to say anything. DM? Okay, sorry, Chair, yes. Um, thank you, Minister. Just two things. The, the question around the legislation in terms of the Domestic Violence Act and the, um, what is the other criminal? I, I will send the detailed inputs of the department as we made them at the JCPS. But just to indicate it was more improving, Chairperson, things like your protection orders and how um, justice is supposed to deal with that. The issues around the consolidation in terms of child marriages and the, the issue around statutory rape, um, the issues around uh, sheltering becoming a core and the rating thereof. But we, we made it at the last time, we will make the detailed document so that when these pieces of legislation comes to parliament, then the members can actually get. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Minister, you don't have to yes, take sir. the entire time. You don't have to no, take no, the I entire won't. time. I won't, but you are taking away my time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chairperson. Just a quick one. Um, I think I want to take it from where the, the DM left to say that Part of what I think needs to happen is for the members to be aware of how we work um, at an executive level through the other coordination, through other clusters like the JCPS and other IMCs and so forth. It might be a good idea for us to make that presentation um, in writing so that people are aware of what else do we do that supports this. I've always said um, to the department that the work that's done by the minister and the deputy minister sometimes gets lost because the focus is always about the programs of the department and yet both the DM and the minister sit in other structures of government to make sure that this happens. 
The second one is for me uh, to say that um, I think I've said to the department many a time that part of what becomes a problem, uh, even when the, the, the members have to do their oversight, in many instances, the members don't see anything that is related to the work that they are doing, even in their own constituency. So it's important for us as a department to have that interest. Where are the constituencies of these members? What is happening there? Do we have the same programs that we are talking about? Because now we are really wanting to focus on the district development model. And so that might even help us. I'm not saying that we'll only go to the constituencies of the members, but I'm talking even beyond the members of the committee itself. All the members who are in parliament have got constituencies. And the best way is for them to see some of the services that we are talking about. Then they can be able to uh, do an oversight even in their own constituencies. Otherwise, Chairperson, I think um, the questions have been answered. Um, and this work continues. I'm fine with it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, I think my last words, which don't need your immediate response, is that uh, the, the area of challenges that is articulated is an area that maybe next time we should have a sense what's going to be done about them. Your skill shortage is in an area where your psycho, social trauma counseling, and so on. And all those challenges, coordination, access to this, to those services and funding and so on. Because it, you, it, 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 if that is not addressed, it means they are there just as a formality. But thank you, Minister, at this point in time. Uh, now we need to move to the next item. Uh, Minister, your team need to stay on this one. Uh, doctor, is it Dr. Harris? It's Dr. Harrison. Yeah. How long, how much time do you need, Dr. Harrison? Uh, I do need 20 minutes. I think this is a critical component. 20 minutes. Yo, 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 yo. Uh, because under any circumstances, we must close at, uh, two, ah, no, it's fine. It's okay. Go for it. Uh, until five past uh, two, am I right? Yes. yes, that's correct, Chairperson. Proceed. Uh, are you related to Carla Harrison? Or is it Carla Harris? Not Carla Harrison. Okay, fine. I'm related to Karen Harrison. Um, Chairperson, let me let me start. And, and firstly, uh, good afternoon to... You, you, will, you will start by introducing yourself. Yes, exactly. Um, mm. So good afternoon, uh, Chairperson and, and Portfolio Committee members, Honourable members, uh, as well as the uh, Honourable Minister, Deputy Minister, um, and officials. Um, I'm, I'm David Harrison. I chair, I, I'm the CEO of the uh, DG Murray Trust, which is a South African foundation committed to developing South Africa's potential. Um, just, just, uh, just for some context, we work with the Department of Social Development quite a lot in terms of early childhood development and, um, and nutrition. Uh, we support initiatives um, such as Elifa Labantwana, Smart Start, Grow Great. And so that's, that's, that's really our, uh, our, our engagement. Um, today, I, I really want to be focusing on what we can do over the next six months uh, to make a significant impact in terms of gender-based violence and, and some of its associated harms. Um, and in this regard, I'm, I'm joined just to say, I just want to acknowledge Dr. Charles Parry and Richard Mitsopoulos uh, from the Medical Research Council, uh, as well as Sinazo and Quello, my colleague at, at DGMT, who may, uh, as specialists, uh, come in and answer any of the questions um, afterwards. But if I may just uh, proceed. Um, yes, so, please. So, so this, is a, this really uh, arose out of a letter that... Um, we wrote and uh, I signed on behalf of uh, 164 uh, signatories, um, academics, researchers, civil society, some government officials, um, as well as some signatory organizations, uh, really in response to the gender-based violence crisis and saying that if we really are going to make a significant impact, we have to address the issue of alcohol um, and especially the excessive um, the excessive use of, 
uh, of alcohol. That's that's probably one of the most significant impacts that that we can uh, th that we can make over a relatively short period of time. And um, and as we'll see, we identified five specific um, uh, five specific interventions that have been shown to work the world over that are implementable at low cost that should be implemented in South Africa as a matter of urgency. And just in framing this, we we have to acknowledge that the alcohol industry plays a positive role in our economy. Um, the figures I use are fairly dated now, but I use them because the South African Treasury has done a review. So these are their own figures, um, as well as, um, as, as comparative figures of harm that we have from studies done by Dr. Perry and, 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 and Dr. Matsopoulos. So, so, so let's acknowledge right away um, that uh, alcohol has an economic benefit, but it's absolutely crucial, and this is what we're talking about today, that we understand the, 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 that, uh, that this is a calculus, that there are benefits, that there are very significant costs um, that have to be addressed. And, and we're talking here today about gender-based violence, and, and let's just be specific there. Um, the studies that have, have done show that alcohol um, is a factor in at least 40% of rapes in terms of the, the, the reports of perpetrators who've been caught. About 40% of, 40 of them say that alcohol played a factor. Um, when we have a look at femicide, women who have died in, at, at post-mortem, um, uh, uh, alcohol in the blood uh, was a factor in 61% of cases. So, so a very, very fundamental uh, exacerbator of uh, or aggravator of gender-based violence. Gender-based violence is about men, how they act, what they, uh, what they think, what they do. It's about power, but it is severely uh, aggravated by alcohol. And if we're going to prevent and start to reduce the rate of, um, uh, of, of violence, reduce the incidence of violence against women, we have to get to grips with it. Obviously, it's, this is not only about gender-based violence. Um, alcohol is a major cause of excess mortality in South Africa, uh, 60,000 deaths a year. That's about one and a half times that of, of COVID. Uh, obviously, we know the relationship between traffic accidents and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder as well. So, so as the committee tries to develop an approach to handle this, it's really important that that we don't sort of get stuck in a very sort of polar, polarized relationship between those arguing for the benefits and those arguing for the cost. We've, we've got to understand uh, and weigh up uh, the benefits and the costs. And studies that have looked at the, uh, economic, uh, the, the economic benefit versus the cost show that if you just look at tax revenue um, as versus the direct cost to the fiscus of, uh, of alcohol harm, you could say that in fact, the net benefit is a positive one. If you start to look at the other spin-offs, the employment, tourism, and other spin-offs, um, uh, and, and you add up on the other side, the cost of loss of earnings, you could say, okay, we're more or less still heading in the right direction, benefits out, uh, uh, outweigh costs. But the moment you start to look a little bit broader, when you look at the productivity loss, losses to the society from ab absenteeism, when you look at the, if you assign any sort of value to life and to health in the country, we have a situation in South Africa where the costs associated with alcohol harm significantly outweigh the benefits. And one of the reasons why this, this is such a massive imbalance is that we have a massive culture of heavy drinking in South Africa, and that's what we have to confront. I've talked only about economic benefits, but what about the social benefits uh, and costs of the alcohol industry? And, and, and this, 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 I think, is where this committee's uh, commitment and the fact that gender-based violence has now become a national priority really emphasizes uh, the fact to us that government is saying that no longer can personal enjoyment of individuals, can socialization and camaraderie that is put up as a positive uh, benefit of alcohol, no longer can that be unlimited. 
and at the expense of women and children who are being abused. So I alluded to the culture of heavy drinking in South Africa. And let me just show you what I what I mean. If you look at the middle, if you look at the middle column, um, which is the per capita consumption per drinker of pure alcohol in South Africa. And you see that the that the average drinker in South Africa drinks uh, five units a day or 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 twice as much alcohol, pure alcohol, um, as, as the world average, and about one and a half times the rest of Africa. We have, we have a problem that is as bad as Russia, as, as bad as, as Belarus. And, and sadly, if you have a look at the age breakdown, the percentage of those who drink, who say they've drunk more than five drinks in the last month, look how, look how severely biased it is towards younger people. 80, 85% of our, of our young boys and men saying that they're already becoming acculturated, they're already heavy drinkers. And so we really need to get to grips with the problem of binge drinking, of heavy drinking in South Africa and understand why. And I don't have to tell you how deeply steep this is in the history of South Africa. The DOP system that, that is, was, is responsible for, for so-called cultures of heavy drinking among mm. sectors of our population. But also let's not forget uh, the history of beer in South Africa, the, the dispossession of, um, uh, of, of, from black women of the sorghum beer industry right back in, in, in 1928, the institution of these municipal beer halls. Um, uh, then the, the, uh, the, the use and the direction of profits from these beer halls um, uh, towards the Bantu administration boards uh, to, to ostensibly uh, uh, upgrade uh, townships, but increasingly to fund the Bantu stunts. This is the, the, these are the roots of the culture of heavy drinking in South Africa. And it comes through in terms of the econ socioeconomic gradients that we're seeking to address. If you have a look here, you can see that a far higher percentage of a black and colored um, uh, men reporting higher in incidences of binge drinking. Similarly, if you look at men who are employed for cash peace jobs versus uh, those who are employed but not for cash, um, a much higher percentage. And so this is the vicious cycle of social and economic marginalization that we need to break. Um, marginalization leads to heavy drinking, heavy drinking leads to marginalization. And this is fundamentally a social development issue. The burden of, of alcohol-related mortality as a consequence falls most heavily on the poorer people. Uh, the yellow are injuries, the blue are, are, are drink-related uh, incidents. Um, and you can see that deaths in lower and middle socioeconomic, uh, much higher proportion, um, much higher number uh, and proportion uh, among, uh, among poorer people. And so the bottom line is that the following national priorities are unattainable unless we curb heavy drinking, and we have to confront this. We will not achieve major reductions in mortality that, that results in 200,000 excess deaths in South Africa uh, if we compare a black mortality versus white, if we don't address the 50 or 60,000 deaths from alcohol. We won't address gender-based violence, and we won't achieve the type of progressive social development we're talking about. And so we're, we're really saying that the president has said, we need to look at drastic actions to curb the abuse of alcohol. We're saying, no, you actually don't have to be drastic. We need to implement policies that have been shown to be highly cost-effective, feasible, implementable at low cost, that will, have a, that will create a virtuous cycle that will have compounding benefits. And these are they, firstly, the comprehensive ban on alcohol advertising, not on alcohol, on alcohol advertising, increases in the price of alcohol, reduction in the legal drinking uh, uh, limits, reduce the, the availability of alcohol and increase access to counseling and testing. In the last 10 minutes, I just quickly want to go through the case for, uh, for each of these and why they're so important to, to view them as a basket that needs to come together. The case for a comprehensive uh, ban on alcohol advertising 
And here we're saying a ban on advertising of alcohol, except at the point of sale, where it shouldn't be visible to those under 18. International studies showing that if you do that, if there's a comprehensive ban, you can get a 1.2 reduction in prevalence. Now, the point I want to make through all of these graphs is that if you look at these numbers on their own, 1.2% reduction, you might say, well, that's not that significant. But when you look at them together, when you put them all together, and when you look at their compounding effect over time, they start to have a significant positive effect. It's like the, the government of the Reserve Bank saying we're going to reduce the interest rate by 0.5%. It has a knock-on effect um, when we consider all the other aspects. And so here we see that, that learning from the international experience, learning from tobacco advertising, you can't do this piecemeal. If you want to be effective in terms of advertising, you need to put a comprehensive advertising ban in place. Piecemeal, uh, limits on TV, limits on billboard is simply not going to do it. In South Africa, we know that advertising harms adolescents for each advertising medium exposure that adolescents in South Africa have, they're 13% more likely to, to drink. So that means if they're exposed to seven media platforms, uh, different media platforms, they're twice as more likely to start drinking early. And as you can see, they not only start drinking early, but they start drinking a lot. We've got a lot to learn from the success of the tobacco advertising ban in South Africa where between 1993 and 2010, we saw a decrease from a third of our people drinking to a fifth of people drinking. And that happened in South Africa while the rest of Africa uh, was going uh, in the different direction. In terms of raising the price of alcohol, I don't really have time to go through this graph, but, but really just saying that there are two strategies that we need to look at. The excise price of, of alcohol in South Africa is in real terms now, lower, much lower than it was in the 60s and 70s. Um, the, the excise price on tobacco has gone up, but, but excise prices for alcohol have, have not gone up to the same extent. So we have to push up those excise prices. We also have to um, look at other measures, um, something mm -hmm. called minimum unit pricing, where we create a minimum unit below which a unit of alcohol cannot be sold. Because as we'll see in South Africa, this price differentiation so that the poorer communities are actually sold alcohol at a cheaper price. That's not on. When we look at the price elasticity of demand, in other words, if you increase the, uh, the, the uh, price of alcohol by 10%, how much, what percentage reduction do you see in alcohol consumption? Overall, we see about a minus 0.5 price elasticity of demand. In other words, Lifting the price by 10% reduces alcohol consumption by 5%. So we have, to, we have to find a way of using pricing as a way of reducing alcohol consumption. And, and, and as we know, uh, that it will have the biggest effect on heavy drinkers. So, so the second is to, uh, is to raise the price of alcohol. In South Africa, um, heavy drinkers in South Africa, as I say, are paying five times less per standard drink than moderate drinkers, and introducing a minimum unit price will have the greatest effect on heavy and, and binge drinkers. So we need to do both. Look at that Look at that beer there. You can see that the big carton, the, th the one liter carton, the 750 mil, is sold at a lower uh, unit price per alcohol standard, uh, uh, than, uh, than the smaller units. This encourages heavy drinking. I'm not going to talk much now uh, about the reduction in, in the legal limits of drinking and driving. There's a very, very strong case to be made for that. Another crucial area is reducing the availability of alcohol. And really three ways of doing that. One is to reduce the density of liquor outlets. Second is to reduce trading hours. And the third is to stop these, these big containers, one liter bottles of beer, five liter bottles of, uh, of wine. And, and we know that by reducing these, this availability can have a very significant reduction in, uh, in alcohol consumption. Finally, and we've spoken about this um, and we've heard from the department as well, we know that counseling, brief interventions, both for pregnant women can reduce fetal alcohol and for, uh, for younger, uh, younger people as well, 
um, putting in place therapeutic responses, counseling is absolutely vital to begin to break the cycle. So my last two slides, what, what I've shown you are five best buys that the World Health Organization says are the most significant and influential ways when put together of starting to reduce alcohol that will reduce gender-based violence. This requires an intergovernmental, interdepartmental strategy um, to, to put it all together. And I would argue that the, that the Department of Social Development is the key department that should be convening a, a, a task team to actually reduce uh, alcohol because, because of this, this cycle of marginalization, heavy drinking that we need to break. Then there's some current legislation that needs to be attended to. The control of marketing of alcohol beverages bill, I don't need to tell you, that's been around for 20, since 2013, never released for public comment. Um, we have to understand what it says in terms of uh, advertising. The Liquor Products Amendment Bill, again, um, some key uh, elements to it. Uh, uh, the limits on the uh, advertising, uh, the increase in the legal drinking age from 18 to 21, which is so crucial because the brain is developing as a teenager between 18 and 21, and our children are fry frying their brains by drinking so much alcohol. And then, uh, and then uh, prohibition on, on liquor outlets. And then obviously the road traffic bill as well. These need, these need to come to the table urgently as a matter um, of, uh, of urgency in reducing gender-based violence in addition to some of the other ills that we have in our country. So let's mm -hmm. make some good come out of COVID. There's been this national, uh, nat natural experiment that's show, shown up the harms of alcohol. I've shown that South Africa's heavy drinking culture is rooted in the structural violence of apartheid. It requires structural intervention. What's not going to work, as we've seen, is a total ban on alcohol simply because it can't be sustained. Illegal industries will boom. Any sort of suggestion that the, that the, uh, that the alcohol industry brings to the table that we must appeal to the individual for responsible drinking is not going to work because socioeconomic circumstances are driving life choices. Industry self-regulation doesn't work. It worries me when I hear that the SAB, SAB is a partner or a contributor uh, to the WhatsApp. I think we have to be very, very careful about, um, uh, about the line that we have with the department and their in, uh, with, with the uh, industry and their insidious invasion into uh, uh, into the role of, of government. What could work is implementing these five strategies, best buy, value for money, uh, that could reduce mortality, gender-based violence, and social fragmentation. Yes, change will take time, but we can start now. And if we do it, um, and if we do it in, uh, within the framework of a bigger commitment to, to addressing gender-based violence, we, we will achieve changes in the culture of heavy drinking which will have a massive spin-off effect for social development. The time is now. Thank you, Chairperson. Yo! Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Up front, there can be no debate that um, the pursuit of discouraging drinking alcohol is necessary. Effects are there. History is there to explain the damage. But doability can at times look easier said than done. And I think you are challenging us to in that manner that if we agree that these are the consequences of alcohol, this is what the alcohol is doing to humanity and against the campaigns that we are trying to pursue, reducing GPV and the many other costs, you are tabling and challenging us that there's path. Where I'm sitting, I'm clear in my mind that you are, you are, you are correct. You are correct, uh, multi-sectoral, interdepartmental, and so on. And you are correct when you say social development must be the main, must show the main interest. Although social development, if you check, they deal with the consequences or, uh, or, 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 or what you call of alcohol. But I'm going to make sure that because before half past two must be out of this place. I'll give not more than two minutes, even less if I can, to each member. Two members want questions. We, we, there's no way we'll go beyond 20 past on this thing. 
Uh, Honorable Bungwenya and Honorable Ibrams, those are the only two members. I'm very happy about that. Honorable Bungwenya. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Harrison. I could give you the biggest hug right now. I feel so vindicated. We must thank COVID said. for that. We must thank COVID for that. So I am very grateful for your presentation. I hope uh, the government listens, and I hope DSD takes up the challenge, do whatever they can to help in this. My, my, my main concern is that when I'm looking at your stats, uh, is that with males, where 15 year olds already are involved in drinking, heavy drinking, 20 year olds. So it is true that this is killing our youth and it is important that we make sure that even the bill that is coming, that is on the parliament now of making sure that we ban the advertising, we should do that and make sure that advertising of alcohol because it entices our youth. So we need to make sure that that's happened. So thank you very much, uh, David. My, my only concern right now I know that as DSD, there's nothing that much can be done, but as, as Chairperson has said, it is an interministerial uh, challenge and duty. What really concerns me is the fact mm. that the ease of, of, of alcohol in our township, every second street in our township have taverns and shippings. And I feel that the liquor board must also take a, a charge into this and stop giving out these licenses willy nilly. Even in front of our schools, there's shippings, there's taverns. So I, it is just a comment that I wanted to make. I don't really have a question, but thank you very much for your presentation. And I truly hope that it brings the change that we need to see in our country, especially in terms of GBV, because it really is upsetting to see that women are suffering mostly with the children. The only thing that I hoped that you would show in your presentation in slide four, I was interested in knowing what the rape cases and the femicide, the percentage that you have put there that uh, I needed to find out the ages mostly, you know, on, 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 the, on the rape, the male, the 40% of males that have committed rape because of being intoxicated. If I can get the ages around that and the race around that, and the one on femicide of the women who were involved and that were found to have been drinking, if I can also have the race and the age around that. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you so much, David. Uh, Honorable Abraham. Um, thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, Dr. Harrison, for the presentation and to all the other collaborators. Um, my, my question to you is just, I'd like to know, have you discussed um, this um, presentation with the alcohol industry, with SAB, with other um, um, alcohol industries, the wine farms, et cetera, um, and what has been the input um, in it or comments on it? And has the, do you foresee a lot of resistance to um, um, your presentation? And then also I'd like to find out in your policy brief, you speak a lot about, you know, maybe piloting it or looking at it in the Western Cape. And I'd like to find out, have you taken this presentation to the Western Cape government, to the other spheres of government at local um, level as well? And then also of the 16 countries um, that you um, are basing this evidence on, are any of them mm. um, developing countries with similar socioeconomic problems um, in situation like South Africa or are they all first world countries? And then also hypothetically speaking, if we could implement this MUP um, tomorrow, um, does your can your research tell us how long before will it be will it be months will it be years before we see um, some positive impact from this presentation? And now I understand that this is just the one aspect, and that you know it's it's a multiple whole of government approach to this um, problem that we're in. But then I also want to find out from you. Once again, a hypothetical question. If we increase the cost of alcohol um, and it's still not working, then we increase it again and we increase it again until we actually get the desired results we're looking for. Are we not then completely sidelining a group of um, South Africans who then just basically won't be able to afford to buy alcohol? I mean, how are we going to you know, mitigate against that? And then um, just, just lastly, um, just a comment. I mean, I think COVID-19 has also showed us another side 
of South Africans in that this is supposed to be a deterrent from people buying alcohol, but we did see quite a few South Africans, you know, buying the higher illegal cigarettes and buying um, alcohol illegal at higher prices. Um, and, you know, alcohol and drugs and substance, it's a disease on the one hand, but it's also... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I just want to make that point that, you know, it's this is not just a, a one-sided thing. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Abams. You are the last one I will stop. And then the minister will need to make a comment. No, Honourable just very briefly. Thank you very much. Just very briefly, Honorable Chair. Uh, I think we need to appreciate the, the presentation by Dr. Harrison. Uh, it's a straightforward presentation. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think we must actually open it up for any vulgarization of some sort. It's a straightforward presentation with clear recommendations, well done, well crafted research. Uh, and I think we must be able to appreciate it and say these are some of the solutions that we need uh, for our government moving forward. And we really appreciate that. And uh, I don't think we must at the risk of uh, sounding a bit relevant, uh, Honorable Chairperson, let's not play politics about uh, some of the solutions which have been presented to our people. Thank you very much. Thanks. Honorable Minister. Thank you, Chairperson, and I wish to thank the Portfolio Committee for inviting uh, Dr. Harrison, um, and I thank him also for indicating the role uh, that has to be played by the Department of Social Development here. And I fully agree that um, the state at which we are in terms of consumption of alcohol and what it does is, is untenable now. And this is the time for us to seriously, seriously do something about it. I agree with the previous members who spoke up about it. And I think that uh, the Department of Social Development has to have, um, uh, uh, not partners, but the mm -hmm. Department of Social Development has to look for, uh, within cabinet itself, by the way, I think that we need to look for friends of the department when it comes to fighting this, because I don't even want to have uh, to make any arguments for, I want to make arguments for not, because as he rightfully does, he goes to the historical background. How did we get to where we are? And we are failing to go back to the history. And I don't think that we should be a nation that is actually proud of how much we are drinking, how much, and I know that there's got to be the balance, uh, as, as some others say, the economy and all that. But right now in this, and, and, and uh, Honorable when you're speaking about what is happening in the townships, every street and how many of these shibins and all that you have. The pride of men thinking that when they are drunk and they go home and the following day, they wake up in the morning, both men and women, and they gloat about how much they were drinking. They gloat about how they don't know how they got to this point and that point. This is a disaster for the nation and we must step up. And I'm saying as a department of social development, we really need to step up working with other partners to, to make sure that it is reversed. In the best way that we can, we have to reverse it. Everyone who's sitting in the room, we fear when the children are now teenagers, we don't know one day they're gonna come into the house drunk to stupor because in South Africa, it's no longer an issue of people just enjoying a glass of wine and a drink. It's binging and then the consequences of binging thereafter. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Minister. Uh, Dr. Harrison, I don't think there's a debate about the significance of what you're putting on the table. I think where I'm sitting, all the colleagues are saying, it's a matter that should be responded to. Already the minister is taking the challenge to look at an executive level. Maybe they can call you to go and present there. And I think the portfolio committee will also have to go deeper into it. You may be called again. Uh, I think you are putting a journey, which I don't think anyone would actually say is, is, is not an important journey. Oh, uh, Dr. Nkosazana, in the 90s, when she dealt with the issue of tobacco, we thought it's something that could not happen. At that time, I remember, tobacco was costing not less than $7 billion from the point of health costs in South Africa. 
doesn't matter how people look at it, it reduced to a significant degree smoking in South Africa. Doesn't matter how you look at it. Uh, because it's a fact, you know, when you are a smoker, you want to brag in the taxi, you want to brag in the train. When it when all those things were stopped, uh, I mean excitement from tobacco got reduced very significantly. So what I'm saying is that if it's got this cost to humanity, unless you want to make one or two comments for two minutes, Dr. Harrison, but we are going to attend to the point. The point is going to be attended to. And we're not going to say on this date and this time, but the principle is that is accepted, that let's check if we cannot embark on this change. Dr. Harrison? Yeah, President, thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate the response uh, from the committee and, and from the minister. And, and just to be clear, we're we're happy to help in whatever way. Um, there, there were 164 signatories on that agreement. Many of them are researchers or academics that have done the work. Um, in that petition, all of them put up their hands to be, uh, to be of assistance. So we can draw on and, and we'd certainly be willing to convene and, and help convene um, a, a, a bigger group so that we can get the capacity to, to make this happen f uh, fast. And, and um, just uh, back to the first honorable uh, member's question around can this happen fast? Well, Scotland introduced the minimum unit price uh, in 2018. Um, by 2020, it had showed a 5% reduction in, in heavy drinking. So, so it is possible. Um, yes, the Western Cape government uh, is very much involved in taking the lead, but, but I think it's absolutely crucial that national governments start to do the same. Um, and, and no, we haven't approached the, uh, the, the liquor industry yet because I think it's very, very important that government and, um, uh, and academics and researchers first have a very clear strategy before they start embarking, uh, embarking with the sector. Pricing okay. You're pricing, you're absolutely right. right. You cannot keep increasing pricing, but we have the op but but what we can do here is have a, is have a balance where we're increasing pricing uh, to a level where we're not increasing uh, increasing increasing the risk. So so just my final point, uh, Chair, is that yeah, is is that um, I would be delighted to work with the minister and work with the department and with the portfolio committee bringing that full capacity to the table. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, one, one simple point, for instance, we may look at, uh, call it a workshop, whatever, where the, the various experts come, the economists, tax experts, international co 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 comparative studies, and so on. Because the South Africa cannot say, we cannot explore the possibilities of discouraging alcohol consumption in South Africa and so on. I think that case is over. Thank you very much, Dr. Harrison. Uh, Lindy, quickly, COVID. We're not going to discuss it. We just need the, because we don't have time now. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, you can be- Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. We've got six minutes or seven minutes to deal with this, uh, with COVID. ATG, our minister, whatever. Thank you. It's just an update. Uh, I'm not going to engage in discussion. I will request members to to write questions and send them. You know, the department must respond quickly in writing on those. We don't have time. Uh, uh, AG, ATG. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, um, I'm trying to, to quickly share this. It's not allowing me to. Oh, there we go. Uh, thank, thanks, Chair. We, 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 will, we will just speak to the issues. Of course, we are now on Level 2, um, and um, uh, with Level 2, um, we are looking at um, a number of other uh, areas that uh, we, we, can, we can consider uh, uh, reducing some restrictions on. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see the presentation now, uh, Chairperson. Yes, Chair, but uh, enlarge, enlarge, please. Oh, okay. The size of the... the, the... Okay, so 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 um, really the intention. You you can't enlarge. Uh, I can, I can chair. When I say there enlarge, I don't mean the I don't I don't mean the print. I mean the size of the what you call. Oh, oh that's Nancy, okay. Yeah, Nancy, thanks. Right. thanks. No, th thanks. Very quickly, we are uh, at level two, of course, as you know. Um, and basically, what we're doing is we're encouraging 
um, uh, the sector and we continue to engage with them on a regular basis to ensure that uh, um, because we're on level two, the risk of infection still remain um, and they're still prevalent. And so we are saying to them that they, we, they must not let their guards down. It's fundamental. You'd recall, Chair, during the Spanish flu um, that um, the majority of people who died, died between uh, the second and the third wave. So we are saying the first wave is gone. We are heading to the second and the third wave, and our sector must ensure that they're not letting their guard down. We're benchmarking, of course, with a number of other countries to see the best practices, and we are looking at Brazil, uh, uh, USA, uh, Russia, uh, Botswana, and one or two other countries just to get a sense on what they're doing in that area. Uh, we're improving our communication uh, robustly so that the sector understands the impact of uh, what's happening uh, at, at level two. And, of course, the way in which this works, Chair, uh, we, we provide, we get guidance from, um, from COCTA in terms of the areas uh, 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 that uh, will be restricted uh, or not restricted at various levels, and then we work that. So our directions are still to come, and they are to come after, uh, uh, now that COCTA released uh, their uh, regulations on Monday, we are working on seeing how best we can manage that. I'll get to that very shortly. But just also we're engaging the sector and other relevant stakeholders before finalizing these uh, directions accordingly. Um, we just, I just wanted to make this point that uh, we're actually the 25th largest population in the world, uh, South Africa, uh, but we're the fifth highest infection rate. Uh, our country has the fifth largest infection rate. Albeit we have very high recovery rates, uh, which I think this morning was uh, about 82% uh, and um, very low death rates. Um, so uh, what are we asking ourselves around this is, how big is this thing? And what, what is what is this saying around the fact that we're the 25th largest population? We are beginning to look into some research around that and seeing what are some of the trends we can see along those lines. Um, lastly, not lastly, second to lastly, just to indicate that in terms of our facilities, you'd note that COCTA has indicated that the movement uh, and vis family visitations are now allowed, uh, and we're looking at the movement of children. These are again our proposals. Uh, in terms of some of our facilities, old age homes, um, we're seeing what we can do in terms of, uh, of, of, of opening up these areas because if you if you recall, um, uh, the elderly haven't seen their families uh, for the past five months or so. And um, the fact that we're at level two, we don't know what's going to happen uh, when uh, the, uh, um, the, the, there's an increase again in the next few weeks. And we're told that in the next 10 days to 15 days, we should expect a, a serious increase of numbers again because we're at level two and a lot of uh, activity is underway again. So we're thinking that in terms of old age homes, we must look at how we can allow visitations because if old people fall sick at, at, at old age homes, the next place they're taken are hospitals. And so at hospitals, it's even worse. You're not even able to go into the hospitals. So we are concerned that the elderly are passing on without even having a chance to meet with their families. So we're trying to see how we can manage that. The CYCCs, um, uh, which are children's homes and secure centers, we are still saying that um, uh, we are restricting visitations uh, with vigorous um, uh, monitoring uh, and following of protocol. So there will be visitation, mm -hmm. but, but, but restricted. Same with the treatment centers, same with the shelters uh, and residential shelters, and same with uh, the shelters for homeless people. Of course, we continue to provide the service that we do, uh, and uh, COCTA and, uh, and SALGA uh, continue to provide the infrastructure in that regard. Just very quickly uh, on ECDs, we're saying that... Um, uh, of course, we all know that ECDs are open, um, and um, uh, we are just saying that uh, in line with the court decision that was taken, ECDs remain open subject to the various measures put in place. And of course, we are continuing the support uh, through uh, uh, providing PPEs uh, and seeing how best we can assist the sector. We're engaging with the sector in this regard. We know that there are challenges around the workforce, and we know that there are challenges around uh, some ECDs having challenges with closure. We're looking into these measures together with the sector to see how best we can assist them over and above providing PPEs. So we're also looking at other measures, including employment stimulus, et cetera. So those are some of the measures that we're putting in place. Um, you know, Chair, the biggest challenge we have with ECDs is that you have just over now, I believe that what we're beginning to hear more and more is that the unregistered ECDs are just above 40,000. So at first we thought it's 33 to 35,000 or so, but it's actually between the range of 40,000 and possibly 50,000 uh, ECDs that are not registered. So we're saying we are ramping up our Vanga Sali program uh, to, ne to the next phase, uh, which is to massify um, the uh, registration of ECDs. Um, and then we're also saying that, uh, of course, we've provided guidelines 
uh, and SOPs which serve as a guide uh, to ECDs in terms of how they should manage uh, uh, screening, how they should manage play areas, uh, and how they should engage uh, in terms of um, uh, the, 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 the changing some level of, um, what do you call this, um, what do you call it? Um, the, the, what you teaching, the stimulus work, uh, but there's another word that we use, the um, curriculum, that's the word I'm looking for. So, so these are guidelines, not prescriptive, these are guidelines. Um, that we're providing to the sector. Uh, in terms of food, we are saying that we, uh, uh, we, we still have the challenge of the demand, uh, which exceeds the availability. But we're engaging with Treasury and other institutions to see how best we can uh, crowd in a little bit more funding in this area. Uh, and we're saying that our own CNDCs um, are, are going to continue with the knock and drop service. So as opposed to providing a plate of food, we want to still provide food parcels and other measures so that we're able to deal with that. Very quickly, maybe if you ask the, um, okay, this is just highlighting the impact on um, on, on, on our business continuity, basically in, in the DSD. We are saying that um, in, the, in the sector, and this doesn't include NDA and SASA, um, the number of offices has clo have closed. I think we have over 137 offices that have closed, of course, bringing an impact to um, uh, to the continuation of service delivery. When I say closed, I mean they're closed for sanitization and, 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 and decontamination. It's not closed con continuously. So we close them for those 24 hours and then we reopen. So um, of course, we've had a number of fatalities. These numbers have since uh, increased uh, dramatically. Uh, I think we're sitting on around um, almost 25 fatalities in the entire sector now uh, across the, 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 the provinces. And um, uh, a number of, the, of our staff are still waiting results and in isolation. Um, but uh, we are continuing to follow the relevant protocols in this regard um, and ensuring that contact tracing and isolation, et cetera, are being done accordingly. So some of, some of these are affecting service delivery, but we've put measures in place to try and see how best we can manage that. Maybe I can ask the CEO of SASA of NDA quickly uh, to talk to this slide, uh, which basically deals with um, the updates from the NDA side. And then following uh, this, we'll have the CEO of SASA. CEO of NDA. NDA. Chair, with your guidance, can we take the CEO of SASA first and then come back okay. to the NDA? Okay, SASA. What happened to the NDA? It disappeared. I think Baseko on the chair. Um, uh, 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 thank you very much, DG. Honorable uh, members, uh, Chairman, I thought rather than just talk to the issue of the payments, it's important to highlight the number of hours that we've lost and uh, the impact on our offices. We have had quite a number of fatalities in our space, particularly in terms of uh, deaths. Uh, they've increased from the 11 deaths we had last week. We are now sitting at 13 deaths. So it is a beginning to impact uh, in our space and making sure that all the places uh, uh, for servicing people continue to be open. But the, 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 the comforting issue is the fact that the recoveries uh, are, are quite high, particularly in the Eastern Cape where the bulk of the fatalities have actually happened. We've had uh, 102 people actually recovering, even though they confirmed cases 139. Uh, so that 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 is showing a, a good signs. Uh, the the other challenging issue to manage is just the panic when uh, people know that somebody is is positive, and to make sure that we all and encourage our people to keep calm, to keep calm, and make sure that work uh, still does happen. And for us to continue to make sure that we create opportunities for us to be able to enable uh, people uh, to work offline, yet uh, in some instances, like in your supply chain environment, it becomes a challenge because it's impacted by the laws and regulations that say people should actually use paper. And we don't want to be found to be wanting when it comes to audit time. Uh, so on the issue of the, of, of the payment, uh, we've just recently gone through our next cycle of payment and that uh, went through uh, okay, uh, except for instances uh, with regards to the persons uh, with disabilities uh, who, who, who fell off uh, from, from, the, from the track. Uh, because we were waiting for the for the what you call for the uh, re directions to be re-signed, they've been re-signed and they will be brought back onto the the the, the cycle for them to continue to be pay get paid uh, going forward. We continue to engage with labour because they, there's concern about us uh, opening up for persons with disabilities. 
to, for us to phase it in for them to begin to come to our offices so that they can be able to, to get the service. The doctors are comfortable to come back. In instances where we, we, we use the, the health facilities, it's becoming quite a huge challenge uh, uh, in terms of us being able to get that support. But I thought it was important rather than talk uh, to the, 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 the payment numbers just to indicate what the impact of COVID is in our uh, uh, different infrastructures and we'll provide uh, the report in terms of where we are with payment. Thank you, Chair. Has DNDA resurfaced? Ah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, let me, CEO of NDA? Let, let me try and talk to the, let me try. Oh, I could, I could have spoken to them because I'm aware of them. Um, awesome. Very briefly, we, yeah, we, we, we continue with our volunteer program and we're trying to find ways to increase the numbers. Uh, as I indicated before, these are our foot soldiers on the ground and um, they are really, really assisting us uh, across uh, 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 the, 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 the country. Uh, the other day we were in, um, we we're trying to, uh, in fact, I was in a mall and there was a whole lot of people uh, at a Sasa um, uh, office. And um, I tried to engage with our people to see how we can extend our volunteers to also try and assist uh, in terms of queue management there because the lines are really, really increasing at post offices. We're also talking to the post office in this regard to try and see how they can assist us. Um, just an update on current funds. I think we've paid just over, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's over 17 million rand last week. 17 and a half million rand. If not, it's 100. How much is it? I think it's 17 and a half million rand yeah. that we paid in one week last week. And we have paid 131 um, um, uh, CS, CSOs. Um, and uh, we're continuing to make the payments in this regard um, so that they're able to do their work around around um, uh, 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 assisting us uh, in, the, in the GBV sector. I must highlight that uh, we were given 12 months to do this project since January. We are on month number eight now and we've already paid a significant amount of, of CSOs. We're continuing to do this and we think that we can actually do much more. But what we're doing is because the money we have is not enough, we're also talking to other institutions, uh, Solidarity and one or two others to see how we can build up more money uh, and uh, uh, so that we are able to uh, further support the sector in this regard. Um, as you know, the fiscus is, is, is extremely strained and we're talking to other institutions to work with in this regard. Just on office rationalization, we are saying the money that we would have spent for rent uh, at a number of our offices in various provinces, we're now beginning to redirect that money to see how best we can assist the sector um, and uh, because we are saving that money. What we're doing in the majority of the provinces is that within DSD offices, we are trying to see where we can uh, bring in some of our staff um, instead of paying rent for, NG, for, for NDA offices, we're saying perhaps they can be housed in some of the uh, DSD uh, provincial and regional offices. So that's helping us in terms of saving money there. Um, yeah, and in terms of business continuity, I think we continue at, at the NDA, we're also working a hybrid model where some colleagues are working from home and some are working from the office and they rotate uh, regularly. Um, of course, there has been one or two infections and we continue to to um, uh, to follow the relevant protocols in this regard. Now that we're at level two, we're trying to get guidance from TPSA in terms of what do we do around um, uh, 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 staff. Of course, those with comorbidities and those over 60 continue to work from home. Thank you, Chair. I'll let me leave it at that. Uh, do you, Minister, do you want to say anything? One or two and before we close? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I think it's it's all um, uh, uh, covered. I, I, I think that um, uh, they, are, they are just, if, if members have got other issues uh, that might be relating to, um, uh, to COVID-19 and, and what maybe they come across and, you know, it's, we, we open for that kind of uh, engagement because Unfortunately, I think the manner in which we're presenting now, we had very little time. So we're not able to go further and the members are not even able to engage with what we have presented here. So my request is that if in case there are other things that members want are, are critical of what is being presented here, they can just send us uh, through your office um, uh, chairperson in case they want okay. other issues to be clarified. 
I, I think the request I'm going to ask, we, we've got no permission to go up to three o'clock. You, you have to get that permission. And I want to say to the members, can they write their questions? Can then, can, can we make sure that ADG by the sunset tomorrow, uh, the responses will have been circulated? Yeah, I think that's fine, Chairperson, because it would also, give, even when we come to the next meeting, if in case we feel there are things that uh, we need to report, because this is a standing item now. Every time we have the meeting, we'll have to, if there are issues that we didn't cover now because of time, we can respond to that. If they were not adequately answered, we can deal with them in the next meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. But the, the one point I want to hammer on, DG, is that we, we don't have to remind the department that this is a standing item. That's why that 48 hour is so critical. Just you circulate the document because we reduce the time of your presentation. We, we take time more on engagement and it makes us use the time in a more fruitful way than the other way. Uh, Lindy, not, not my game. <laughs> I was about to say you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Mr. Tavo. <laughs> Uh, anything uh, else? No, Chair, we, we've concluded the agenda for the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, honorable members, for that cooperation as usual. I'll always love you, and we'll work together in this session. And uh, at that point in time, the meeting is closed. Thank you very much. Have a good day in Parliament. Viva, Madiba, viva. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>